that's a little orientation. Um, to start the key events, um, we've we've read all of these, and we're about to read the seven and eight here, uh, part of eight. So seven and part of eight those key events. Now there are 70 key events um, and they take place. Uh, several took place here in the early world. Several um, take place, I think, up to 12 or 13 in the patriarchs. Uh, they don't show you in this which are the patriarchs. Um, I'm going to fix that, uh, so I'll show it to you next time. Um, and as you can see, let's see, when it gets to Exodus, that's when it changes. So this is all in um, the beginning is the early world up until 12. So up until 6 here is early world, the first, the first 6 or the first 5 are early world. And then from 6 down to... 14, those happen in the patriarchs. So 1 to 6 up here, and then, or 1 to 5, and then from 6 to uh, 14, all of these take place in the patriarch time. And then it moves on to Exodus over here, Exodus. 15 down to, let's see, I'm going to have to fix this for next time so it'll be a little easier, down to 24 is Exodus. All takes place in the, ex in the Egypt and Exodus period. And then numbers. Um, you can see that 1, 2, 3, 4 take place in numbers. Over here, desert wanderings is the time period and um and the books here are numbers the third book and so it goes on um the 70 time the 70 um key events all basically tell the one big story of salvation and that's how the program is set up so that as you go through the Bible, it will say this is the key event. Um, as we, as, as you look in the patriarchs, you'll see the key events. So I just want to orient you to that first before we get started. And then we will be right here. We'll be starting with seven and part of eight. Okay, we're on day seven in the Patriarchs. We're reading Genesis 14 through 15, Job 3 to 4, Proverbs 1, 8 through 19. And just to orient you where we are, um, in the 14 narrative books, we are in the first narrative book. In the, the 12 time periods, we are in the second time period, okay, the Burgundy first half of Genesis is the early world, the second half is the patriarchs. So, um, just a little more orientation. Here's a better visual. In the 12 time periods, we're in the second one. In the narrative books, we're in the first one, Genesis. The supplemental books, Job, we're going to be reading three and four. And God's family plan, you'll actually hear God's voice on this particular part of the reading for the one holy tribe, where the Abram um, in Genesis uh, 15, he talks to him. So we did hear day six. We happen to have that part. Day seven happens to be Melchizedek blessing Abram and the covenant and all that. So um, uh, you'll see it's under the, the Abrahamic covenant has three promises to be fulfilled 
in three future covenants. The land promise, the mosaic, and that's the one we're doing today. And then, of course, there, here are the other two, but we won't be reading those today. Okay. And the world power happens to be Egypt at this time. And then I wanted to show you where we're at in the covenants. So we're only in the first book of the Bible, and we've already done two, and now we're getting to the third, one holy tribe, the Abram, Genesis. Okay? So let me go back to our picture. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Okay, so the first half of Genesis 14, 11 of the verses talk about this battle of the four kings and the five kings against each other. And there's a guy on YouTube that he acts it out on a game board with little game pieces. And it's, I thought it was good because it's a physical representation because when you're reading all these words about the battles and all that, he kind of acts it out with these game pieces. So I'm going to put the link in the description. So we're going to start our reading in the Bible here. Oh, and then afterwards, let me just tell you, afterwards, we're going to be going to Lynn's Timeless Treasures, where she does a commentary on Day 7. She also embeds Day 7 here, so you can just listen to it right from her page, and you can go forward to from the readings right to his analysis. So, um, she gives these commentaries, and we'll read this after we do the reading of the Bible. She gives a little commentary on the Job, a little commentary on Genesis, and then she does something really cool down here. She does a little um, daily defense, suffering with purpose, and why would God allow physical evils like suffering and death? So I, I just think it's nice. So we'll read that after we do the reading, because some people don't want to hear that. So um, you can just listen to the reading and go, or you can come back and, and read with us. So Okay, so where's our Bible? So this first half is the little battle of the four, the, the four and five kings against each other. And you can watch it over there. Um, but uh, but you'll, see, you'll you'll hear as much as good as I can on the pronunciations, um, one through eleven verse, and then it gets into uh, Abram. So when Kim when when Am Raphael king of Shinar and Aria king of Elisar, Chater Laom king of Elam and Tidal king of Goem made war on Bera king of Saddam, Bersha king of Gomorrah, Shinab king of Adma, Shemember king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, that is Zor. All the latter kings joined forces in the valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. For twelve years they had served Chedorlaom, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Cheddar Laom and the kings allied with him came and defeated Raphaim in Ashteroth Karnam, the Zuzim in Ham, and the Emim in Shaveh, Kira Theum, and the Horites in the, con the hill country of Seir as far as El Paran, close by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and they subdued the whole country, both the Am Amalekites and the Amorites who lived in the Hazazon Tamar. Thereupon the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma and the king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, marched out, and in the valley of Sidim they went into battle against them, against Ch Chater. Laam, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goam, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Erok, king of Elisar. Four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of bitumen pits, 
and as the king of Saddam and the king of Gomorrah fled, they fell into these, while the rest fled into the mountains. The victors seized all the possessions and the food supplies of Saddam and Gomorrah, and then went their way. They took with them Abram's nephew Lot, who had been living in Saddam, as well as his possessions, and departed. A survivor came and brought the news to Abram the Hebrew, who was camping at the oak of Memri, and the Amorite, a kinsman of Eshkol and Anar. These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been captured, he mustered 318 of his retainers, born in his house, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He and his servants deployed against them at night, defeated them, and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. He recovered all the possessions. He also recovered his kinsmen lot and his possessions, along with the women and the other people. When Abram returned from his defeat from Chedorlaom, the kings who were allied with him, the king of Saddam, went out to greet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. Melchizedek, the king of Saddam, Salam, Salem, we would probably say, um, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the God Most High. He blessed, he's the first time we see the priest. He blessed Abram with his these words, blessed be Abram by God most high, the creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who delivered your foes into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Saddam said to Abram, give me the captives, the goods you may keep. But Abram replied to the king of Saddam, I have sworn to the Lord God most high the creator of heaven and earth, that I would not take so much as a thread or a sandal strap from anything that is yours, so that you cannot say I made Abram rich. Nothing for me except what my servants have consumed and the share that is due to the men who went with me, Anir, Eshkol, Mamre, let them take their share. And what I like about the USCCB is they give a little description here um, about all of those uh if you don't want to watch that fella's um, thing, you can go back to UCSB and he'll, it gives you a little bit of, a, uh, of an explanation of what was going on. So let's go to 15. And we'll hear God's voice. The covenant with Abram. Soon time afterward, the, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not fear, Abram. I am your shield. I will make your reward very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me if I die childless and have only a servant of my household, Eliezer of Damascus? Abram continued, Look, you have given me no offspring, so a servant of my household will be my heir. And then the word of the Lord came to him, No, that one will not be your heir. Your own offspring will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if you can. Just so, he added, will your descendants be. Abram put his faith in the Lord, who attributed it to him as an act of righteousness. He then said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans, Chaldeans to give you this land as a possession. Lord God, he asked, how will I know? that I will possess it. He answered him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these, split them in two, and placed each half opposite the other. But the birds he did not cut up. Birds of prey swooped down on the carcass, but Abram scared them away. As the sun was about to set, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a great dark dread descended upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will reside as aliens in a land not their own, where they shall be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation. They must serve. And after this, they will go out with great wealth. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace. You will be buried at a ripe old age. 
in the fourth generation your descendants will return here for the wickedness of the amorites is not yet complete when the sun had set and it was dark there appeared a smoking firepot and a flaming torch which passed between those pieces on the day the lord had made a covenant with abram saying to your descendants i give this land from weighty of egypt to the great river the euphrates the land of canaanites and canaanites and Cadamonites, the hittites and perizzites and raphaim the amorites and the canaanites and the Gir girgashites and the jebusites so that's 15 and again you can read a little thing and we are going to read lens but let's go now to uh job and it's job three and four so let's go to books of the bible and go to job three and four Job's complaint. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed his day. Let me just come over here and put this up. Um, no. I meant here. Sorry, I didn't mean to make that big. So here we are, Job. Okay. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed his day. Job spoke out and said, Perish the day on which I was born, the night when they said the child is a boy. May that day be darkness. May God above not care for it. May light not shine upon it. May darkness and gloom claim it. Clouds settle upon it. Blackness of day affright it. May obscurity seize that night. May it not be counted among the days of the year, nor enter in the number of the months. May that night be barren. Let no joyful outcry greet it. Let them curse it who cursed the sea, those skilled at disturbing Levithan. May the stars of twilight be darkened. May it look for daylight but have none, nor gaze on the eyes of the dawn, because it did not keep shut the doors of the womb to shield my eyes from trouble. Why did I not die at birth, come forth from the womb, and expire? Why did knees receive me, or breasts nurse me? For then I should have lain down and been tranquil, had I slept I should then have been at rest with kings and counselors of the earth who rebuilt what were ruins or with princes who had gold and filled their houses with silver or why was i not buried away like a stillborn child like babies that have never seen the light there the wicked cease from troubling there the weary are at rest the captives are at ease together and hear no overseer's voice small and great are there the servant is free from the master why is light given to the toilers life to the bitter in spirit they wait for death and it does not come they search for it more than for hidden treasures they rejoice in it exultingly and exultingly and are glad when they find the grave a man whose path is hidden from him one whom god has hemmed in for me sighing comes more readily than food my groans well forth like water for what i fear overtakes me what i dreaded comes upon me i have no peace or ease i have no rest for trouble has come Four. Eliphaz first speech. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, If someone attempts a word with you, would you mind? How can anyone refrain from speaking? Look, you have instructed many and have made firm their feeble lands. Your words have upheld the stumbler. You have strengthened their faltering knees. But now that it comes to you, you are impatient. When it touches you, you are dismayed. 
Is not your piety a source of confidence and your integrity of life your hope? Reflect now when innocent person perishes. Where are the upright destroyed? As I see it, those who plow mischief and sow trouble will reap them. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his wrath they are consumed. Though the lion roars, though the king of beasts cries out, yet the tenth, the teeth, of the young lions are broken, the old lion perishes for lack of prey, and the cubs of lioness are scattered. The word was stealthily brought to me, my ear caught a whisper of it, in my thoughts during visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on mortals. Fear came upon me, and shuddering, that terrified me to the bone. Then a spirit passed before me, and the hair of my body stood on end. It paused, but its likeness could I could not recognize. A figure was before my eyes. In silence I heard a voice. Can anyone be more in the right than God? Can mortals be more blameless than their maker? Look, he puts no trust in his servants, and even with his messengers he finds fault how much more of those who dwell in houses of clay whose foundation is in the dust who are crushed more easily than a moth morning or evening they may be shattered unnoticed they perish forever the pegs of their tent are plucked up they die without knowing wisdom so we just read job three and four and now we have proverbs one eight through nineteen so let's go back and read Proverbs 8.19. Proverbs 1, 8 through 19. Yesterday we read this part, today we're reading this part. Instructions of parents and women wisdom. The path of the wicked, greed and violence. Hear, my son, your father's instructions, and reject not your mother's teaching. A graceful diadem will they be for your head, a pendant for your neck. My son, should sinners entice you, do not go if they say, Come along with us. Let us lie in wait for blood, unprovoked. Let us trap the innocent. Let us swallow them alive like sheol. Whole, like those who go down to the pit. All kinds of precious wealth shall we gain. We shall fill our houses with booty. Cast in your lot with us. We shall all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their path, for their feet run to evil. They hasten to shed blood. In vain a net is spread right under the eyes of any bird. They lie in wait for their own blood. They set up trap for their own lives. This is the way of everyone greedy for loot. It takes away their lives. Okay, so let's read Lynn's um, commentary that she put on here. Not her commentary, but what she put on. Um, and as you can see here, you can go right here, and day seven is right there, because she has, if you look up here, you can see day seven, Genesis fourteen fifteen. just so you know where you're at. Um, and the commentary is from the St. Joseph edition of the New American Bible on the book of Job. The debate which ensues consists of three cycles of speeches. Cycle 1, Job 3. Cycle 2, Job 15. Cycle 3, Job 22. Job's friends insist that his plight can only be a punishment for personal wrongdoing and an invitation from God to repentance. Job rejects their inadequate explanation and calls for a response from God himself. At this point, the speeches of a youth named Elihu, interrupts the development, Job 32 through 37. So it gives a little bit of context to understand. 
a commentary on God's oath, the nation, the land of a nation, um, the great adventure season four or session four, rather, um, patriarchs part one, understanding the scriptures, the Didache series, chapter five, God's promise to Abraham was hard to believe as Abram, an old man and Sarai barren still had no children. God spoke to Abram again. Fear not, Abram, I am thy protector and thy reward exceedingly great. Genesis 15, 1. Then Abram dared to ask God how this promise could possibly be fulfilled, and God promised him his own son would be his heir. Even though it seemed unlikely, Abram believed God's promise, but he wanted assurance. God answered to Abram was, in the form of an oath. In the time of Abram, serious oaths were usually sealed with a sacrifice with animals representing the people who were swearing the oath. So God told Abram to bring a heifer, she-goat, and ram. The animals were then cut and laid the pieces out. During the night, a lamp of fire appeared and passed between the two divisions of animals. With this action, God made a covenant with Abram, saying, To thy seed I will give this land. Genesis 15, 8. And then she has here um, sort of a uh, an explanation. Of, you know, Job went through so much. And so, a daily defense, day seven, suffering with a purpose, challenge, why would a good God allow physical evils like suffering and death? Defense. We don't have full answers to the problems of evil in this life, but we can see that at least some physical evils are helpful. God can tolerate some physical evils because good comes from them. According to John Paul II, Certain forms of physical evil belong to the very structure of created beings, which by their nature are contingent and passing, and therefore corruptible. Besides, we know that material things are in a close relation of interdependence as expressed by the old saying, the death of one is the life of another. So then, in a certain sense, death serves life general audience, and this took place June 4th in 1986. We see this in the natural world, such as when a lion kills a zebra so that it can eat. The death of the zebra serves the life of the lion. In the same way, the living things we humans eat, whether plants or animals, sustain our lives. The Catechism says, with infinite wisdom and goodness, God freely willed to create a world in in a state of journeying towards its ultimate perfection. In God's plan, this process of becoming involves the appearance of certain beings and the disappearance of others. The existence of a more perfect alongside the less perfect, both constructive and destructive forces of nature. With physical good, there exists also physical evil, as long as creation has not reached perfection. Catechism 310. Pain can also play a valuable role in our lives. Some people suffer from congenital insensitivity to pain, and its results can be dramatic, even fatal. Physical pain serves as a warning system, and people without a proper pain response can be severely injured or killed. Even emotional pain can be useful. The emotion of fear alerts us to danger and motivates us to take steps to avoid it. Although some suffering plays a vulnerable, a valuable role in the present life, it doesn't exhaust the problem of evil. Unlike the above examples, some suffering serves no obvious pur purpose. Keyword there, obvious. See the question for day 38 and the above answer. However, provide a partial explanation of why God tolerates some suffering and how he brings good of it. I just talked about a book that um, that just came out about suffering. Let me find the title. It's Catholic uh, author, and it's called Why All 
people suffer how a loving god uses suffering uses suffering to perfect us dr paul chalo i'm going to spell it c h a l o u x so it's french sounds like dr paul chalo okay um and then I have it in Kindle, so I thought I'd just pull it up. Um, yeah, it's a it, it's a very good book. I've just begun reading it. Um, and here I'll just give you a little bit of the um, contents. Uh, uh, suffering as a Detector of Evil, the first task, Developing the Human Virtues and Proper Self-Love, a second task, Reorienting the Soul to God, the third task, Unleashing Love, the fourth task, Redeeming the Sufferer, Section 2, Suffering in God's Providential Plan, Addressing the Problem of Evil, Physical Evil as an Opportunity for Growth, Natural Evil in a Contingent World, Suffering conscience and the evil of sin the evil of punishment rebuilds goodness divine action the theology of suffering section three answering the call to a share in nature of god all people suffer in life the role of the church finding joy with chronic illness living with terminal illness and dying well the role of the sufferer as a messenger of god the call to help the finding the the joy in finding meaning in suffering and <clears throat> i just want to say when she mentions here well this particular on um from it actually comes from jimmy aiken the daily defense 365 to become a better apologist um what what they're talking about here is pain can play a valuable role some people suffer from congenital insensitivity to pain um and the results can be dramatic even fatal that's true and also often when people have had trauma or have had a lot of abuse in their life they don't recognize danger sometimes and so they can end up uh in even more dangerous situations because that the the pain does not you know when you when you have pain like you're about to touch uh, a hot stove and it will burn you that's your warning well if you have been um in a trauma sometimes you won't always recognize because you your your pain tolerance I, I don't know if it increases or what happens but uh trauma can actually make you ignore whether the body goes into denial or what um when when danger comes i think uh being a victim often will make you more um more uh vulnerable to um to further trauma because you know you would think it would tell people okay don't do that and sometimes it does but sometimes it doesn't so anyway that's the supplement for today um i hope that you found it uh helpful and um there this is a good book i have to tell you i started reading it i read i'm reading so many books that at one time it's like i get i'm like well where did i which where did i get that one from what did i what did i get um that one for and wait a minute why i started reading this so i'm reading constantly so um yeah so this is a very good book and uh i suggest if you have that question um that you read this book because it, it's i have to tell you it's been very very good so